Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to ITV. My name is Fatima Umar and we are here today at the annual convention of the Islamic Medical Association. Um, the convention is supposed to last over three days and we're looking forward to everything that this convention is going to bring. What is interesting about this medical convention is that although it is aimed at medical professionals as well as allied health professionals, it caters for the family. As such, there will be concurrent programs running for the youth as well as children and a session for spouses. Being part of the Islamic Medical Association, we expect the three days to run in an Islamic ethos and we look forward to everything that this convention will bring us. Do stay tuned as we find out more from this exciting convention. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to ITV. We are here today for the Islamic Medical Association annual convention based at Birchwood. With me is Professor Akhtar Ghulam Mohammed, a pulmonologist as well as the chairman of the convention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Professor, and welcome. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about the convention this year, what has been the theme for this year's convention? Uh, the theme for this year's convention is from education to action. From education to action. Okay. Okay, and um, the guest speakers which you have chosen, uh, if we could maybe start off with your international keynote speakers, um, Dr. Ali Michal. Can you tell me the reasoning behind him coming and um, what were your thoughts on this? Ali Michal is uh, an endocrinologist. He's from Jordan mm -hmm. and he's based at the Islamic Hospital in Amman. Mm -hmm. He's been primarily involved in the hospital development of the Islamic Hospital there. He's also quite involved in ethics, and he's uh, currently the director of the Federation of the Islamic Medical Associations, which is the umbrella body of all the Islamic medical associations throughout the world. His expertise essentially is in hospital development and ethics, and that's the main reason we've brought him, as, uh, as I'm sure you, you are aware, that the IM is trying to establish an Islamic hospital in Durban, mm -hmm. and we are hoping that he can contribute uh, to some aspects, particularly from the ethical point of view, as to how this hospital should be developed. He's also being an ethical specialist, he's giving a number of talk, talks on Islamic medical ethics as well. Okay, so his focus has been on both ethics as well as discussing the concept of an Islamic medical center. Um, and this links a little bit to another one of your guest speakers, Dr. Walid Bidzahi, um, the founder of the Islamic, the International Medical Center in Jeddah. That's right, Dr. Walid al Fatai is one of, is the director of the center in Jeddah, and he's also developed the Islamic hospital, and uh, he's also been brought here predominantly just to discuss the issues around development of Islamic hospitals. Okay, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the other speakers that have come and the reasoning? Yeah. Hafez Muhammad Idris, he's an Islamic scholar, and he's been brought mainly to uh, develop for us the, the theme in terms of the education, and particularly in terms of education of us as Muslim healthcare professionals and also then how to apply this in terms of in the action and that's the reason for him. So he's essentially predominantly to fit in with our theme of, is of from education to action. Okay. The education, is it based solely on medical education or is it more of a holistic approach? No, it's a holistic approach, so it will include Islamic and medical uh, development. And in fact there, fortunately, we've also got a local guest speaker Molana Zaki Vauda, mm -hmm. who has been also giving us talks on Islamic education, essentially, where he discusses some Tarbiya programs with us. Okay, um, and you have one more uh, speaker as well, Ibrahim Hewitt. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about him? Ibrahim Hewitt has also been involved in education. He's from Leicester in the UK. Uh, he's predominantly involved in terms of the Muslim schools in the United Kingdom, and he was also on the board of one of the Muslim schools in Leicester. And he's also been involved as an educationist. He's also been a journalist as well. And so he's got uh, enormous experience in journalism. And he's also been involved in a number of Palestinian issues as well. And uh, that's one of the other reasons why we brought him. Uh, and also to address us on issues in the media as well and developments uh, in the Muslim world uh, as a broad education for Muslim healthcare professionals. I have noticed that one of the other themes that came, seems to be coming up a lot um, in the conference is the Arab Spring, and you've had quite a few discussions on that, both local and international content. 
Um, any motivation behind this? It's basically just to uh, address us in terms of the Palestinian and the Islam and the uh, Islamic uh, government or, or countries that are Islamic essentially, and that, that, that was the main motivation. Mm -hmm. I think it is an excellent word choice um, because it's very current and it's something that people need to be constantly made aware of. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of effort has gone into planning this convention, and I'm wondering how are you finding it. Do you find it a successful convention? Are you happy with the number of people that have attended and how it's been going so far? Yeah, Alhamdulillah, we're very happy. We've had a very good turnout and we've reached the target that we expected uh, in terms of the number of delegates. Uh, and certainly uh, from the point of view of the quality of the talks, that's where we're particularly very happy. We've had a superb uh, uh, amount of uh, speakers that have delivered their talks superbly. And so Alhamdulillah, the content of the convention has been superb. We tried to break it up into a number of seminars. So, for example, this morning we had a seminar on where we looked at doctors themselves as patients. We looked at stress in, in the lives of doctors, how to prevent burnout, what Islamic spirituality will mean for doctors in terms of preventing that. Mm -hmm. We've had a, a seminar on ethics this morning, and we discussed a couple of issues regarding ethics. Uh, we've had, uh, as you pointed out, the Arab Spring. We had that as a topical issue. Uh, we've had, we're going to have this afternoon some women's issues, especially regarding women's health. We had an exercise camp for them this morning, and then we'll be discussing issues like breastfeeding, etc., for women as well. Okay, so you seem to be catering all across. We're catering all across. We've got a program for the kids as well. There's a little children's program, and there's a youth program as well. And uh, on top of that, we've got a parallel student program. The students from the WITS, uh, Medical uh, Muslim Students Association, have organized their own program uh, and a number of students from other areas have joined them. The program has been organized purely by them and they are joining us on some of the plenary sessions. Okay, that's excellent. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Professor Mohammed, if you could maybe just tell us, because this convention is held on a yearly basis, so maybe you could just give us some insight into next year's convention. Gee, it's, as you pointed out, it's already the 32nd annual convention of the IMA. We tend to rotate the conventions between the various centers. Uh, so usually it will be uh, Johannesburg, Pretoria the one year, and then uh, Durban, and then Cape Town. Uh, within the Johannesburg, Pretoria area, we split it uh, one or the other way. So this time it's been the Pretoria branches uh, turn. Mm -hmm. And next year it's Cape Town. Uh, Cape Town next year, inshallah, they're planning a major conference because they want to have it later in the year in September. They're planning it together with the Federation of the IMAs who will be having their council meeting with that particular convention. So we expect it to be a, a larger than normal convention with many more international guests as well. Shukran for your time, um, Dr. Mohammed. Jazakallah khair. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. That was Professor Akhtar Bilal Mohammed giving us an insight into the convention, um, themes behind the convention, and what to look forward to next year. Shukran and wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu la takunu kalladina adam musa. فبرأه الله مما قالوا وكان عند الله وجيها يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله وقولوا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إنا عرضنا الأمانة على السماوات والأرض والجبال فأبين أن 
يحملنها وأشفقن منها وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا ليعذب الله المنافقين والمنافقات والمشركين والمشركات ويتوب الله على المؤمنين والمؤمنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما صدق الله العظيم On behalf of the Convention Committee of the Islamic Medical Association and the National Executive of the Islamic Medical Association, I'd like to welcome one and all of you officially to this convention, although I know you started from this morning. Uh, and as you know, as often happens in the IMA, I was not uh, volunteered for this uh, post as convener, but delegated to do the duty and alhamdulillah, uh, together with a relatively new team from the Pretoria branch or Shwane branch of the IMA, uh, we've managed to set up this convention for you. I'd like to thank my convention committee, uh, particularly Sister Kashifa Martin from the Johannesburg office, who has done tremendous and sterling work. I'm sure most of you have troubled her in the last couple of months, but I think without her, this convention would definitely not have taken place. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to uh, allow her to work for the IMA in her current position, because certainly uh, she's done tremendous work. Uh, but I'd also like to thank my fellow colleagues on the convention committee, Professor Mahmoud Ali, Dr. Mohammed Amin Fulat, Professor Anwar Hussain, who done a lot of spade work before he left for Riyadh, uh, Dr. Shakira Ismail, Dr. Shanaz Muhammad, and Dr. Farid Umar as well. Um, I'd like to thank a number of other people that helped in a number of issues. Uh, uh, they are listed in your uh, convention brochure, uh, but a number of people helped to put together the dental program, the optometry program, the children's program, the youth program, uh, publications, public relations, and a number of such issues. Looking after guest speakers, uh, we have a number of people that helped us with that as well, and we'd like to thank one and all of them for this. It's my pleasure to uh, uh, trans transmit to you the Salams of your brothers in uh, FEMA Executive Committee and FEMA President who wish you the best in this uh, activity and in all your activities. The topic uh, of this presentation is uh, somewhat new because the experiences of ethical committees in most of uh, Arabic and Islamic universities and institutions has not been gathered together and presented uh, in a way that is uh, useful for uh, Islamic hospitals and institutions. And I understood, inshallah, that you will have an Islamic hospital here. And I thought this, this will be uh, useful, inshallah. Uh, Ethical standards of medical practice and clinical research, especially those conducted on human beings, are sometimes looked upon as theoretical frameworks and texts, especially in our countries. Very rarely we read documented practical applications in our hospitals. Studying the practical experience of the IRB at the Islamic Hospital in Amman, which started more than 12 years ago, is not worthy to shed useful lights on a first documented practical application of bioethics. Prior to the regulations in Jordan, 
uh, about uh, committees of medical ethics. The Islamic Hospital formed its own uh, ethical committee in 1987 uh, under the name of Committee of Medical Ethics. والصلاه والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرا باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الانسان من علق اقرا وربك الاكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الانسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم أو كما قال النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته For an ordinary man like me to stand in front of the gathering of doctors, surgeons, physicians and specialists It's just like to stand before a herd of lions. And the talk we heard, so scholarly talk, so research work, where Dr. Michel has joined the jurisprudence side of Islam and the medical side of Islam. the science assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh it is my privilege to introduce our next speaker uh, brother ibrahim huge is from uh, the uk he was educated in newcastle and received his tertiary education at the university of leicester he is extensively involved in both the media and education and he has taught and lectured at various schools and universities he has contributed to numerous publications and has been editor and editorial consultant for a number of books and journals. He has also participated in numerous television and radio programs internationally, and he has held various honorary positions. Amongst them, he has been chairman of the board of trustees for Interpol, or the Palestine Relief and Development Fund, and he's been assistant secretary general for the Muslim, board of, uh, the Muslim Council of Britain. Presently, he is a senior editor for the Middle East Monitor, and he's an education and media consultant. His topic today will be from education to action. Education to action. It was only when I got here yesterday that I actually realized that this is the keynote theme of the conference. So it's you know, no pressure at all, alhamdulillah. Uh, we can look at this in two different ways. Education for action and education, uh, sorry, edu action. If we just shuffle the C around, we get edu action, action within education. Both of them are very, very important. It's something we have to, to understand because the education that we impart, the education that we receive, should not just be theoretical. That has to be made very, very clear. It should be enjoyable, it should be engaging. We heard the Hafiz Idrissa mentioned about the education for girls. And in Britain, certainly, the girls are outperforming the boys, alhamdulillah. Whereas before, this is across the board, before the governments were concerned that the girls were being edged out of science subjects, now they're concerned that the boys are not bothered about science subjects. In fact, the boys are not bothered full stop. It's true. It's not cool to be in education. It's not cool to be good at school. And the sort of behavior and attitudes which we used to see uh, in, in young boys 14, 15 years old, we're now seeing in 9 and 10 and 11 year olds. So they're disengaging from the process, and that is very, very worrying. But the educational institutions that we have need to reflect this change. We need to engage our kids and young people and adults. Education should be a lifelong experience. I notice you're all getting your, your barcode scanned for your CPD. This is what it's all about, from the cradle to the grave. I haven't got a barcode. 
I'm going to complain to the authorities here. It's one of the, I haven't been barcoded. But the point is, what are we learning about? What should we be learning about? This is an important aspect, because we've been told, obviously I've mentioned, Iqra, about Al-Qalam, learning, reading, writing, how important it is. But what are we learning about and what are we doing it for? And the purpose of our creation is to worship Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Yusuf Talia, and I am the current president of the Muslim Students Association Union. Uh, it's going to be a tough task coming after such uh, prolific speakers, so I'm going to try my best. Allow me to enlighten you about the role of the MSA Union, its vision, mission, and planned activities. The theme of this presentation is the role of the MSA in the 21st century. The Union of Muslim Students Association is an umbrella body that represents the members of all respective Muslim Student Association chapters in South Africa. The MSA is the largest Muslim student body in the country and works very closely with various MPOs in fulfilling its objectives. The vision, the vision of union is simple. However, to reach our goal, all parties must commit. The vision is to develop every Muslim into a role model by serving creation through their every action being solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We plan to use technology in every possible way to reach our wider target, the Muslim student. Behind me on the screen is some of the themes that come out in our mission statement, uh, which you can see later. In addition, we plan to address national student issues by creating an influential body and by working with other student organizations, such as the South African Students Congress. The IMA is a well-established body in society, and we believe the experience can be helpful to the MSA to reach a wider base. We do have some common goals, and together we can aspire to achieve these. This will be possible by us building a relationship with the IMA and ensuring that this is maintained through the fluctuations of the MSA. There is a large turnover in the MSA committee members and part of our goal as the union in the 21st century is to ensure long-term sustainability of union. We would also like to work more closely on IMA projects when called upon to assist. The medical students within MSA could benefit greatly from the doctors within the IMA, especially with regard to mentorship and by creating networks. The problem that MSAs face nationally is student apathy. In the short term, our major focus will be to get students to become members of the MSA and then to organize events on or off campus that people can relate to and be a part of. May Allah bless you all. If you want me to share with you the dream, I will. Who wants the dream? Okay, a few minutes. 1982, I was doing my engineering. I saw a dream. I saw Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, sits on his throne, surrounded with people wearing white. And I saw a man on his left side. And I asked in the dream, who's this man? They say his name is Dr. Ahmed Al Qadi. I never saw him in my life. Two months later, I was invited in Maya, which is a convention center in America. I went into a lecture, I sat, and I saw the man who I saw in my dream. I asked the person next to me, who's this person? He said, you do not know who this person? His name is Dr. Ahmed Al Qadi. And he started telling me who Ahmed Al Qadi is. After the lecture finished, I went to speak to him. He, had, he was surrounded with so many people. So I waited and waited and waited. And at the end, he looked at me and said, you've been waiting long. And I said, because whatever I'm going to tell you now, I cannot share with you in front of people. He said, come sit next to me. He sat in the chair, and I was sitting in the chair next to him. 
and I started giving him the, telling him the ru'ya. All I saw in the floor is basically drops of tears. And then he said, son, have you ever told this dream to anybody before? I said, no. I said, alhamdulillah. He said, son, I would like to share with you a secret that nobody knows except for me and my wife. I love Jesus so much to a point that I go to the old books of the Injil Torah and take all those statements which are consistent with the Quran and I create my own book of Isa alayhi salam only for me to read. However, son, this dream is not for me, it's for you. I said, no, no, doctor, you are the one in the dream. I said, no, he said, no, son, God wants you to come to me so I can interpret for you right. He said, son, every prophet has miracles. But the prophet of Isa alayhi salam, most of what, most of what is in medicine, he resurrect his yuhib mawta bi'idhnillah wa yubri'u al-akma. It's all healing. He said, are you in medicine? I said, no, doctor. I'm engineering, but I'm thinking to go to medicine. He said, son, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to use you to put the seed to bring back the empire of medicine in Islam. And that dream is for you. Today, when you showed Dr. Ahmed Al-Qadi, I realized that I must share this dream with you. He was a great man, and I'm following the footsteps of this great man. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum. The program is going to be pretty short. I know you're all getting hungry by now. You've got some savories there while you're feeling peckish. We'll just have a few short presentations before the starters. I now call upon the president of the IMA, Dr. Ibrahim Khan. Jazakallah for the opportunity. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa la akibatu lil muttaqeen, wa salatu wa salamu alayka ya rasulu al-nabi al-kareem. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the most beneficent and the most merciful. And abundant and immense praises be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallam. It gives me great pleasure and it's an honor for me to stand before you as the president of the Islamic Medical Association and to address you on this occasion of our annual convention. I want to thank each and every one of you for gracing this function and for being present over here. And I especially want to thank our honorable guest, the Minister of Health from Palestine, as well as all the other uh, important guests and dignitaries that have come to grace this function. While I welcome you with an open heart in the Islamic Medical Association Convention, I wish to say at the same time that all protocols have been observed. I think that the Islamic Medical Association provides a unique opportunity annually to all its members and supporters to gather together as friends and more as a family. And I think it gives us all an opportunity to meet and greet each and every one. And if you look at the atmosphere in our convention, it is unique in the sense that it is unlike others where we are able to create this family atmosphere. And if you look uh, at everybody, everybody is happy, smiling, joyful, welcoming each other with open arms and meeting each other sometimes after a year or after many years and the pleasure that it gives them. So I think that this is a great opportunity. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khatam al-anbiya wa sayyid al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man sara ala nahjihi wa aqtafa atharahu ila yawm al-deen. Yaqulu ta'ala, Subhana alladhi asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu. لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير Dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I am coming to you from Palestine from Palestine the Holy Land from near the Al-Aqsa Mosque from the besieged 
Gaza. I am coming first to thank the people of South Africa for the long-standing support of the Palestinian struggle for freedom. I am coming also to thank you all for the continuous support of our struggle against the occupation and the siege. And tomorrow, inshallah, we will participate in launching the second Africa convoy towards, from South Africa towards Gaza. I thank you also, all of you, especially Ima Board, Maulana Hassan Hendricks, Pima Board, and Al Quds Foundation, who facilitate this visit, and give me the honor to speak to you about Palestine in general and the health sector, especially in Gaza Strip. But also, I am here to congratulate the people of South Africa for the Day of Freedom on the 27th of April. And I hope we will be able soon to ceremonate with you the Freedom of Day of Palestine uh, in Al-Aqsa Moshe and around Al-Aqsa Moshe. IMA, as you all know, commenced in 1970 as a weekend service to rural areas. That, in fact, laid the seed, the seed to provide health services that was then to progress later into fixed clinics in KwaZulu-Natal. And presently, we have 500 patients seen on a daily basis. And I can assure you, all 500 patients are very satisfied with the service that we provide. Many of these patients would leave state clinics, but would come to an IMA clinic because medicines are available, a meal is provided, and we have very dedicated staff, and we must thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that, that they actually run clinics. The doctors supervise these clinics on a weekly and, annual, uh, weekly and monthly basis. But it is the nurses, and even if you have a hospital, it is the nurses that are gonna run this hospital. It's not the doctors. The doctors are gonna be there for a short time. They move away, but it's nurses, and we need to harness nurses train them properly, and make them feel that they're part of the organization. Many of the social issues in the community are addressed through Beit al-Nur, and further to this, we have mobile clinics that go from point to point in the deeper rural areas, and a unique project that I wanted to mention yesterday at uh, Dr. Wadi's lecture was that we've started in Durban for the last four to five years a dialysis project a very expensive project, and we were wondering that how would this project be sustainable? But alhamdulillah, for the last four to five years, we've found that we've helped many patients. And we've given them a window of opportunity, and where the state had refused treatment, we find that these patients have lived four to five years and even longer. And in these four to five years, they've actually been of use to the community, of use to their families, and these are moments that they cherish. In fact, one patient actually told me, before the World Cup, I want to see the World Cup. And this, this was really not possible for these patients before that. It is in fact a matter of both an honor and a privilege to stand here in front of the medical elite of the Muslim world and present the case of Rifa International University. This is an institution of its own kind out of all the Pakistani universities due to its primary focus on quality education and Islamic ethics. In today's presentation, I would like to cover the scope of the university and how are we achieving it in the past 10 and 20 years. This is the pictorial of the university. Well, Rifa International University was established by Islamic International Medical College Trust back in 1997, established by the Honorable Major General Dr. Muhammad Zulfikar Ali Khan. It is a non-profitable, non-secretarian, 
non-political welfare trust organization with an aim it started to help the Muslim Ummah in solving the pressing problem of deteriorating medical standards, of academic standards through the development of good Muslim doctors, engineers, and social scientists. And we are doing it precisely for Razai Elai. We have a mission to establish state-of-the-art educational institutions with a focus on inculcating Islamic ethical values. To us, Islamic ethical ethics are important in all the professional curricula because Quran and Sunnah are the ultimate source of divine guidance for the Muslim. This guidance should be inculcated not only in the personal lives, but also in the professional institutions in the curriculums also. Well, our philosophy of education system does not only focus on the cognitive development of our students and staff, but we also rely and focus on the effective and psychometric domains working for the improvement of attitude and skills of our people. I've tried to enlist the salient features of Rafa International University. We're the first in Pakistan to introduce the problem-based learning and integrated curriculum. The teaching hospital method, teaching methodologies of totally reflect the Islamic ideology and ways of life. Apart from the contemporary things like continuous medical education and quality management systems, we have student-centered education and therapia at all levels. We are intensely focused on research and inquiry, and we present the teachers as the role models. Continued with the features, we are mentoring the programs under Tarbiya for the teachers first. We offer them leadership development programs. We conduct a specific professional ethical diploma for the faculty. We have life and living programs comprehensive for the students, LD extracurricular and co-curricular activities. We have the first student-owned and student-run FM radio station in Pakistan. We endorse discipline and dress code, and we're very particular about the gender separations. We are launching the IMASA Foundation, that's the Islamic Medical Association of South Africa Foundation, to ensure not only the survival of the organization, but also to ensure its growth. As you can see, they put me here to, to present this because I'm being the treasurer and I've been looking at the bleak position of the Islamic Medical Association, and I had to now take action before I pass on the baton to the next treasurer. I want to also recognize one of our founding members, namely, the late Dr. Anwar Adam, as being the first member to contribute to this foundation. Those of you that know Dr. An Anwar Adam, I think you're aware that he was also the Honorary Consul General for I Italy, which was quite strange. What is the foundation? It is a fund that has been set up without the chair of the foundation, who is Professor Akhtar Ghulam Hussain, who is also the convener of this convention, and of course the Council of Imasa, to invest funding that you will provide, inshallah, and the proceeds will be used to fund the organization in the event of a shortfall. Imasa being the, home for, the only home for Muslim healthcare professionals, hence it is important that we all contribute to this fund, and inshallah, as Dr. Ghulam Hussain always says, you will be rewarded in the hereafter. One of our big problems is the staff. Uh, we have committed staff, well organized, but many of them are not qualified. And one of our problems under the siege, how to send the staff to be uh, more trained <coughs> or qualified, or how to receive staff from outside to enter Gaza Strip to train uh, the, uh, our colleagues. Uh, we have launched uh, some programs with many organizations all over the world, including IMA and PIMA here in, uh, in South Africa to help uh, upgrading and uh, training our uh, staff. Still, we are really suffering. For example, Gaza Strip with 1.8 million uh, Palestinians. We, we have only one nephrologist with uh, a diploma. We have no, for example, a, a neurologist and rheumatologist. We don't have, uh, we have a guest doctor, a guest doctor as a, the open heart surgeon. Uh, therefore, we have shortages in many uh, subspecialties. In 1983, 
Just three years after our birth as an organization, we had a call from Abul Fazl Mohsen Ibrahim <coughs> to say that he was doing a PhD at Temple University in the States, and uh, his topic was Islamic biomedical ethics, and he wanted assistance. And this was like manna from heaven. So when Abul Fadl came and we sat with him, and we had in the meanwhile prepared a questionnaire on the various issues and topics that we needed to be answered. We had it translated into Arabic and into Urdu. We had sent it to Pakistan and many other places throughout the world, Malaysia and Indonesia and the, uh, I think about 15 or 20 places. And we didn't get much joy. And uh, we were still struggling and here comes a man who wants to do a study on this. And of course he sat with us he was very particular. He wanted to understand the questions, the background, etc. And fortunately for him, he had a very good uh, teacher in uh, the late Isma Ismail Farooqi. May Allah have uh, mercy on him and fill his grave with uh, Noor, who advised him that, look, this questioner is very, very extensive. And it'll be advisable for you just to choose a few topics and get your PhD on it. And then for the rest of your life, you can continue doing it. And we were very blessed that he got his PhD. And then uh, in the, as uh, the leader of the DA would say, Madam Zul, he became a refugee in South Africa, an educational refugee. And that was our blessing. So he joined, the, uh, at that time, the University of Durban Westville as a junior lecturer. And he has grown in that field and is now the full professor of Islamic studies in the Department of Theology. He has grown enormously. He has become an international figure. He has been quoted in courts of law when it came to Islamic medical ethics. He has lectured throughout the world, Australia, Japan, Indonesia, Tashkent. I don't even know where Tashkent is. Uh, throughout Africa, England, uh, he has been called out for his expertise, which he has developed. And the main beneficiary of his expertise has been the Islamic Medical Association. Because from the beginning, his thesis, he gave it to us, we published it in, 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 in our first uh, book that we published, The Biomedical Issues and Islamic Perspective. He published two other books with us, An Introduction to Islamic Medical Jurisprudence and Reproductive Health and Islamic Values. Uh, in addition to that, he has produced many booklets which we annually produce. He has produced many, many journal articles which we have produced and he has produced and many other international uh, journals as well. So he has been an enormous blessing to us, which Allah sent to us as a blessing. The Islamic Medical Association of South Africa Annual Award for Muslim Health Professionals presented to Mohsen Ibrahim for his outstanding service to the organization, presented on the occasion of the 32nd Annual Imasa Convention Gauteng, 27th to the 29th April 2012, in the quotation from the Quran, Verily, as for men and women who accept the truth as true, and who offer up unto Allah a goodly loan, they will be amply repaid and shall have a noble reward in the life to come, inshallah. In the past, for far, we have a car driving and then projector screen we have in the past. And TV also we have. And the, the, for the near, we have a lighting and book. But today, we have a car, same, a projector screen, TV, GPS, PC, mobile phone, lighting and book. It means past 10 years to current situation, the distance also changed the life. You can see the distance change in between the far and near. That is the intermediate. Usage is very big time to consume in the day. So we don't have the GPS 10 years back. We don't have the computer so much 10 years back. Also the mobile phone also. So lifestyle was changed. So, and also the device, uh, digital device has a screen. 
in TV, we have a screen. In the computer, we have a screen. Mobile phone, we have a screen. So in the 10 years past, we used to use the brown tube. Now, this is a, uh, the energy of the light. You can see the, the, the 380 nanometer to 500 nanometer. It, it's calling the, the short wavelength. It is blue. The level of the blue is around 20. Then we change the technology. For example, the mobile phone using the LED, iPhone also, I, uh, iPad, computer, everything use the LED to look the blue light. Uh, the brown tube is 20, and then now 60. So it means that a lot of the blue light is coming. So what the, the, the blue light creating the, the glare and the flickering. That is also the change the light side. I think we all agree that we have a, re, we, we have a failing health system. We have problems in terms of declining life expectancy. We have worsening maternal, or we have relatively poor maternal and uh, infant mortality rates. But over and above that, we have a very, we have a quadruple burden of disease. So HIV and AIDS and TB contribute significantly to our population's poor health status, but we also have problems in terms of violence and trauma. Uh, I did indicate that life expectancy is poor, and at the same time, our health system does not give our population value for money in terms of living a, a healthy life. Over and above that, the funding pools in our health system are fragmented. Within the private health insurance environment, we have just under 100 medical schemes, and, and, and that fragmentation in itself results in a situation where the rich and the healthier have access to a larger pool of funding compared to a larger section of the population which carries a greater uh, proportion of the, of, 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 the bur of, of, the, of the disease burden. We also have huge exposure to health-related catastrophic expenditures. Sometimes you go and see a specialist or you are admitted in hospital, but the co-payment that you need to pay for the services that you've received is quite significant. In some instances, you have to get a second mortgage on your house or sell something in order to meet the bills. Linked to that uh, exposure to catastrophic expenditures, we also have a problem in terms of hospice-centrism and commercialism. So those are the two main problems that we need to deal with in terms of our health sector. We need to focus more on primary health care services, ensure that people access the health services at the appropriate level, and also it's not wrong for somebody to be in private practice, but I think to be purely driven by the profit motive at the expense of the patients becomes a problem. Then we have inequitable access to health care resources in our country. In the private sector, we spend about 11,300 per capita uh, compared to the public sector, which spends just under 2,700 per capita. Also, if you look at the distribution of human resources between the public and the private sectors, there's significantly lesser ratios between health professionals and the population in the private sector compared to the public sector. We've also had problems in the medical schemes industry. I won't delve quite long on this slide. Suffice to say that contributions for medical scheme coverage keep increasing on an annual basis, way, below, way beyond uh, consumer price index. And that in itself is also linked to the problem that there's a continuous increase in the cost of services that are offered by providers in, in, in the health sector. The consequence of this is that benefits are exhausted and individuals, by the time it's August, November, don't have benefits and they rely purely on the state to provide services. Now, there are no simple solutions to the problems that I've just indicated. And the problems that I've just indicated is just a tip of the iceberg. There are much more problems in the health system than, than what I've just spoken to. Government recognizes that these problems cannot be wished away, and so there's something that needs to be done about it. I'll go now straight into the constitutional obligations on the foundation on which national health insurance is based. The Constitution places an obligation on the state to provide everyone with the right to have access to, so the first one is healthcare services, including reproductive health care. And most importantly, I think it's the second point, the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of these rights. This is the foundation upon which NHI is based. Remember, NHI is not seen as a silver bullet that will sort out all the problems in the health sector. 
but one of the main things that we need to change in order for us to ensure that the performance of our health system improves is we need to change the way health services are funded and we need to change the way the health system is financed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I want to thank Akhtar for inviting me. In fact, I was quite surprised when he suddenly called me one day uh, whilst I was consulting in my rooms to say, Hussein, you went to Ahmed al Qadi. I said, yes, uh, 25 years. I'm glad to say, yeah, that you say I'm amongst the younger group. Uh, I'm sure there are people in this audience who know him much better than I do. Uh, I have a friend who's in the audience somewhere who was with me, Ahmed Bayat, uh, the cardiothoracic surgeon. We were a group of six students who went to Panama City, and I thought I'll just fill you in on some of our experiences with, with him. He passed away at the age of 69 in 2009 after suffering a massive stroke. Allah grant him Jannatul Firdaus, inshallah. I know he was instrumental in touching lots of people's lives. And although we only spent two to three weeks with him, he really grounded us in some of our future work and was an inspiration. He studied medicine in Austria and went to the US in 1965. He was a thoracic, so-called cardiovascular thoracic surgeon in the USA. He pr produced lots of articles, and after Akhtar called me and I looked his name up on Google, it was amazing how many of his uh, research articles came up, and some inspirational words, which I think one of my daughters looked at as well, and my niece, and I hope it will touch them as well and inspire them going forward.